I'm Alex Mosed, and welcome to Winner Take All, where we talk about the constant battle between large tech monopolies and traditional incumbents. So today, uh, first topic is Twitch is, and, and this doesn't mean 1337. Uh, if you're a gamer, you already know what this is. If you're not a gamer, this is code word for elite. You can you can kind of kind of see uh, the the elite ish in that, but um, basically, just take my word for it. That means elite. We've gotten some more data on Twitch's performance here. If you don't know what Twitch is, they are clearly the winner take all uh, video streaming platform, live video streaming platform, particularly uh, for for video games. Look at this chart right here. You can see average concurrent viewers on Twitch. Uh, in, in 2020, 2 million user number. Um, we'd covered maybe back in uh, Q2 of last year of 2020, the Twitch COO did an interview on CNBC and was just kind of talking about the massive spike in viewership they've had due to COVID. Um, and we have now actually seen, you know, you say, okay, well, a lot of people are trying to figure out, does the COVID bump, does it go away? You know, do you return back to normal? Um, or, you know, does that COVID bump remain and then you build on top of it? And at least for Twitch here, what you're seeing, it's actually the latter. You can see, look, I mean, just look at boom, look at April all the way up here. Uh, this is monthly hours watched on Twitch. You're at about 1.6 billion hours here on Twitch. And then it kind of came down over the summer months. But now what you see here going into the end of the year is it, it actually started to rise. Not to say that you can you can track this corollary across many other verticals, like let's say food. Uh, you've just seen crazy swings in food consumption uh, moving towards you know the grocery retail channel as opposed to the restaurant channels. And so a lot of people are trying to figure out where does that rebalance? This isn't exactly the same parallel, but you could take this maybe more closely as a parallel for digital purchasing behaviors or digital consumption behaviors not maybe between one channel or the other, but that digital user behavior. How much of that digital user behavior, uh, like Instacart, for example, um, versus shopping in the store, you know, how much of that tends to snap back to what people were doing prior? And um, at least in Twitch's scenario here, um, they're actually keeping those gains and then adding on to them. That to me is one of the really significant takeaways from this report here. And they have a couple other fun stats towards the end of this. Uh, 3.6 million live viewers on, t on Twitch. Um, you know, it's kind of a hallmark here. 136,000 live channels. Um, 1.9 billion hours watched in December 2020, right? April was roughly around 1.6. You've got almost 20% gains there from April to December. Other fun little nugget on Twitch. They were supposed to be acquired by Google. Google gave a billion dollar offer and it, they didn't go through with it because of antitrust concerns and Amazon snuck in to get this deal. We've talked about the new CEO at Amazon, Andy Jassy. I know whose idea it was to buy, who was really advocating and, and uh, pushing, was the champion to buy Twitch and Amazon, Andy Jassy. They got it for a little under a billion dollars. It was actually a little bit under what Google was offering, but there, you didn't have the same antitrust concerns that, that, there, that, that was present uh, with, with the Google acquisition. So Amazon was kind of get in there, a little bit less money, nothing too material though compared to Google's offer. Is Andy really driving that from what I've heard uh, internally at Amazon? A fantastic acquisition. You look at what they've been able to do with live streaming and, and what this thing would be valued at today. Granted, Amazon has really helped accelerate a lot of Twitch's growth, but still, you know, irrespective of that, uh, you know, Twitch is just uh, ha has has created immense value um, since uh, since that roughly billion dollar acquisition price tag. So Twitch is leet. OK. This Elon story. So, you know, we, we've talked about um, Elon in the context of GameStop. We were talking about Elon's interview with Vlad. We covered that on the last episode. And so, you know, Elon just keeps coming with the hits here. Everyone's probably, I'm sure, heard of the $1.5 billion 
uh, Bitcoin purchase by Tesla. And you know that if Tesla is buying $1.5 billion of Bitcoin, Elon has been in Bitcoin and easily put billions of dollars of his own money. He oscillates back and forth between number one and number two, wealthiest person people in the world between him and Jeff uh, Bezos. But you know, Elon personally has billions of dollars and and um, and now he's putting actually Tesla's money into, into the ring as well. So how was the tech coverage of this? Was the tech coverage positive or understanding or, um, you know, giving, giving Elon credit for possibly um, hedging some of the risk that, that not just Tesla, but could be on the horizon? I mean, when you look at equity markets, I mean, come on, come on, gang, equity markets. I mean, it just doesn't make sense what's going on. Okay, you cannot tell me that there is sound justification for the prices you're seeing in equities in the stock market. It just, there are, I think, significant discrepancies between the, the, the multiples that, not just tech companies, I mean, these, these, you know, you look at the platform monopoly multiples now and they are, they're very high. And I think what you're seeing is a byproduct of a series of things, but namely what happens when you, you know, print $7 trillion and you have insane uh, quantitative easing, easing and all these kinds of unprecedented actions um, which have been taking place. That's some of what I think has, you know, led to uh, this story around um, Elon saying that he's actually going into Bitcoin to kind of preserve liquidity and, and, and hedge themselves. So this is the information. Uh, no one could ever accuse Elon of taking the conservative path. The minute he puts Tesla on financially sound footing, he decides to invest 1.5 billion of the company's cash reserves in Bitcoin, one of the most volatile assets around. Just imagine what he'd do if Tesla had the cash stockpile of an Apple, Microsoft, or an Alphabet. I mean, clearly Elon's just a madman, right? No one this guy just doesn't make any sense. One of the richest guys in the world, just guy is completely off his rocker, right? Why would he ever buy $1.5 billion in Bitcoin? Just because everything else in the markets make complete sense, right? But yeah, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, those companies, each of which have between $100 and $200 billion in reserve, take an ultra conservative view of where to put the money. All three say that their uh, investment philosophy is to preserve and maintain liquidity. And they put their money in corporate bonds, government bonds, mortgage-backed securities, and CDs. Amazon and Facebook do the same thing. So why isn't Tesla falling in line? Huh, Elon? Can't you just get with the program? Then there is Tesla, which revealed today in a filing. I hope you like my narrative here, uh, my, my overlay. It had updated its investment policy to provide us with more flexibility to further diversify and maximize returns on our cash. Hmm. Interesting, right? Um, that isn't needed for operating liquidity. Let's just think about this. Tesla had only $20 billion in cash. Its business generated just a, a share, you know, a shy of $3 billion in cash after capital expenditures. So the business is, is, is free cash flowing, $3 billion, right? He's saying, look, I don't need all this money to operate the business. Actually, the business is in a great position. We're booking tons of orders. We got plenty of demand. We're, we're, we got positive free cash flows. Um, including after all of our capital expenditures, right? All of our investments that we're making in the business. Um, so not just on a, you know a PL on a on a profit and loss basis, right? Making cars is a very capital intensive business. Thanks, Sherlock. And yet it chose to put some of its cash reserves into Bitcoin. Now here's the best part of this. Tesla said it may also invest in other alternative reserve assets such as gold bullion. One thing is certain, though, says Martin Pierce from The Information. This is certain, right, according to Martin. Tesla is taking an unnecessary risk with the paltry, paltry $20 billion in cash, $3 billion of free cash flow in the past year, paltry, $1.5 billion in Bitcoin with the paltry amount of capital it has. Thanks, Martin. Really astute reporting on this one. I actually think this is a genius decision. We had Jim Rickards on the show past few weeks. Jim Rickards, not the biggest Bitcoin guy, but 
Similarly, pointing out that these are unprecedented times, gang. And you can't tell me with a straight face that what's going on in the equity markets, in uh, the, the multiples that these platform monopolies are getting and just continue to get, makes sense. I mean, for Platt's sake, Platt's on fire, Platt's unstoppable, um, which you know I love in that sense for Platt. I mean, it's hard. How do you bet against the platform companies? And look at this. This is, we're five weeks into the year. We're five weeks into 2021. Platt's up 10%, almost 11%. We're five weeks in. It's up 10, 11%. Okay. Makes sense why it's getting a lot of inflows. But I mean, I'm not saying what you should be investing in. It makes sense why platforms relative to the rest of the market continue to outperform, but just valuations don't make sense. Some people are going to try and tell you why they make sense. I'm not that guy. Okay. And to take less than 10% of the company's cash reserves and put it into Bitcoin doesn't seem like a ridiculous decision to me, Martin. And actually, to put it also into other currencies uh, or you know, reserve uh, assets like gold also makes a lot of sense to me. I think we're, you know, can you, can you say to me that there isn't an inflation factor in the stock market right now? It, sh- it sure looks like inflation to me. We may not be seeing inflation on the CPI index, right? You know, how much do you buy uh, a quart of milk at the grocery store for? But again, I've already talked to people from the Fed about that. And they even admit to me, one of the Federal uh, Reserve uh, governors, I think maybe the guy from like St. Louis, um, I was talking to the guy at uh, the Aspen Festival Conference, uh, which usually happens in June. So this must have been Two Junes ago, this was June of 2019. I'm talking to the guy. He's on, you know, he's on the board of the Federal Reserve. I think out of St. Louis, and he was like, "Yeah, I mean, the CPI is not accurate." Uh, well, I knew it wasn't accurate, but how did you just admit that to me that it's not accurate? You're from the Fed, and I mean, he had different reasons than I had reasons for why the CPI and the CPI is, you know, it's it's like a think of it as like a basket of a hundred products, right? And you track the price of those 100 products, right? But what you're seeing with platform models and what you're seeing just in the sense of, um, you know, platform and and let's just say Amazon, right? Amazon driving down prices for for the basket of those 100 goods, right? So if you want to track the price of those 100 goods, if you give a greater weighting to the price of those 100 goods on Amazon versus from your local grocery store or your local retail stores, if you see inflation in the latter bucket, you know, the, the retail stores for those hundred products and you want to kind of, you know, cause the fed doesn't like to show inflation and you want to try and say, well, you know, if we, if, if we actually track the CPI based upon the price on Amazon, you know, we would actually show net, net neutral inflation, right? No, no, no inflation uptick, right? There's so many ways that platforms are skewing these inflation uh, measurements. Another one I'll give you, we are not tracking any of the produced value on um, certainly content platforms, like like any of these UGC, which is pretty much the majority of all the content platforms, right? Think about all the content people are creating on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, the list goes on and on and on, on TikTok, on, you know, right? Is that being tracked in, for example, the GDP tracks, trackings, right? No. Um, how, how is GMV on Amazon being tracked uh, from a GDP standpoint, right? So all of these metrics and KPIs that the Fed is tracking have, have really fundamental kind of, um, you could kind of call it like platform leakage, but in the inverse direction, right? It's kind of just platform disruption into how the Fed tracks these numbers. And it, it, just, it just means that there's a wide variance before, let's say, inflation seeps its way into the, the, the Fed's inflation tracking metrics. Could we be seeing that in the equity markets before you see it in the real goods? I'd say so. Anyway, I highly recommend you, you go and listen to the Jim Ricketts interview if you haven't. He touches on a lot of this. Also, it's in his, in his book, uh, The New Great Depression. Um, great book, great interview. There are just a lot of things that I think 
prudent investors, not ridiculous investors, Martin Pierce, prudent investors who are looking at what's happening and saying, you know, I just don't know if this all adds up. And then you say, yeah, like if I got $20 billion in cash, could I take seven, 8% of that and put it into Bitcoin and not be called ridiculous and, and kind of alluded to that I'm some kind of idiot? Yeah, I think you certainly could do that. Probably pretty astute, prudent decision, I'd say, Elon. Elon's the man. What can I say? Okay. Speaking more truth, trust and safety. My favorite topic, trust and safety. Talk a lot about content censorship. Talk a lot about what's going on where, where tech monopolies have, have, have essentially turned content moderation, content censorship, trust and safety into a competitive advantage. They've es if essentially turned it into a moat, a barrier to entry for these smaller alternative uh, content platforms and social media network competitors uh, like Clubhouse, which I'm going to touch on in a second, or Telegram, which we've talked about, or a myriad of others, my five oxymorons, which I've covered previously on the show. They can't invest in this stuff. Why? Because it costs a lot of money. How much money would you say? Well, you know, there's actually not that much information out there on this. So um, sure enough, I had to dig into it and try and figure it out. So let's check some of these out. Okay. Content moderation solutions. That's kind of what these uh, reports call it. Content moderation solutions market will reach almost $12 billion by 2027. I saw some other reports that said this is growing at like a 10% a CAGR, which means compounded annual growth rate. So you could say if this is like five, six years from now, and it's going to be at 12 billion. I mean, let's say you're in the mid to high single digit billions of dollars in um, spend today. This is really a, a U.S. number. Of all the regions, North America is expected to hold a dominant share in the global content moderation solutions market. They're saying 1.9. This number is low, and I'm going to show you why. It's much, 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 much higher than that. So that's one report, content moderation solutions market. Here's another report, key vendor strategies, right? So who's going to do this work? I've talked about how, you know, Facebook itself has hired over 20,000 people to do content moderation, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are tens of thousands of uh, consulting firms and contractors that are also doing a lot of this work. And so here is some of the stuff that they're selling, these kind of consultants, right? They've got some tools around artificial intelligence to screen some of the, 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 the content. This is ironic, upholding freedom of speech, uh, real-time content moderation, adopting employee-centric policies, I guess, to like shield the, you know, the humans from viewing sensitive or graphic content. This is another chart. You can see here North America dominating this relative to uh, the rest of the world, Europe kind of being behind that. I actually think the U.S. is is extremely dominant, even more so than this chart. And I'll show you an example why in a second here. So let's look at Infosys. Infosys, if you don't know who they are, one of these massive, like hundreds of thousands of employees, outsource services, right? Uh, BPO, business process outsourcing, right? You'll They'll just outsource a bunch of stuff. They've got people all over the world, which, which are going to bring your, you know, your cost per hour way down to do a lot of this work that's just too expensive to do onshore, let's say, in the United States. So this is actually a product offering from in Infosys, the Infosys media platform. And if you look at actually what it talks about, providing AI, artificial intelligence, ML, machine learning-based, scalable, and cost-efficient media services and solutions. And here, so the metadata management and the curation module provides the master workflow and ingest content from internal archives and multiple sources and includes functions like automated quality control, editing review, approval, and sensor editing. Here's their little blurb on content moderation. Using the video content and speech detection capabilities, the Infosys Media Platform and recognize presence of mature content, profanity, violence, gore, etc. The information is provided at the shot level, which enables a sensor editor to easily review and clip the content. Alternatively, same information can be used by video players to jump content at runtime to provide demography appropriate viewing experience. Yada, yada, yada. 
Um, they've got image processing in here. This is NLP, natural language processing based analytics. It gives you a number of different solutions, but content censorship, content moderation is a key part of this offering. So let's look at Infosys' financials. Fortunately, they publish an annual report every year. If you rewind the clock, they don't have these business revenue segments and customers broken out in the same way. See this high tech section. High tech. This is not in the report from 2018, right? The, the historical one. This is something that was new, which was only introduced in, in the 2020 and the 2019 report. In the 2018 report, they don't have it broken down and you know they have financial services, they have retail, they have communication, but they don't have high tech broken out. And, and the reason why I think that's significant is that they did $844 million in revenue just in North America from the high tech sector. Okay, that's 2019. They did $920 million in revenue just North America from the high tech sector in 2020. Okay, see what I'm getting at? 920 in 2020 from North America, high tech. 844 the year before high tech, but it wasn't broken out in the prior annual reports. And so what this means to me is when you just look at the growth of these other of these other units that they have, and you look at the areas that are, you know, financial services, it's growing uh, by a few percentage points. Retail, few, you know, maybe a couple percentage points. Communication, also somewhat similar in this area, having nice growth. Energy, a few percentage points. Manufacturing, a few percentage points. High tech and communication, right? Um, really driving this growth. And high tech not even being a customer segment when you rewind the clock uh, you know, a few years before to the 2018 annual report. And then you look at the offerings that they have, and they actually even break it out here too. Uh, you can see here, digital versus core services, and they do it by um, high tech, you know, by each one of these customer segments, right? So here are the descriptions. Digital services comprise of service and solution offerings of the group that enable our clients to transform their business. These include offerings that enhance customer experience, level, leverage AI-based analytics and big data, engineer digital products and IoT, modernize leg legacy technology systems, migrate, da, da, da. Core services comprise traditional offerings uh, that have scaled and industrialized over a number of years. This includes application management services, proprietary application development services, kind of more like the bread and butter of the firm. If you look at what's really growing between the, you know, the two of these, this digital portion here within high tech, high tech overall is growing a lot, is growing very quickly. Why is that relevant? Because there's a lot of money in content moderation. And look at the breakdown of high tech revenue by other, <laughs> other continents, 920 in North America, 27 in Europe, 29 in India, five in the rest of the world. It's not like they don't operate in the rest of the world. I mean, yes, North America is their biggest uh, part, but look at, you know, look over here, right? Look at the totals. These numbers are very different in high tech than they are over the totals, right? So emphasis, massive company, global company, they're represented all over the world. You are seeing, I think, content moderation services and a multi-billion dollar kind of overnight industry here. Overnight in the sense of it's come about in the past few years. I think it's really taken on a life of its own. I think that's why you, you're starting to see an emphasis here break out the, um, this as its own customer segment, right? Like what does high tech need to outsource? I mean, they literally make their own servers. They literally manage the servers for the whole world. For the whole world. High tech is not outsourcing the same kinds of BPO um, business process outsourcing services that a bank is or retailers are. This content moderation product and service offering is very unique. And I think that's really giving um, a, you know, a big jump. Not the only thing in this high tech bucket, but I think a very material part of this bucket and what other companies like an emphasis are doing. Not to say that it's mutually exclusive, right? These tech companies are engaging these outsourced contractors, BPO providers, and 
They're also hiring people internally, right? I've said Facebook is you know, over 20,000 people. So um, the next part of this is I was looking at, um, you know, what WhatsApp is doing, because we've talked a lot about WhatsApp and this article uh, in Techonomy. WhatsApp is a threat to society. Here's how to fix it. Talks all about how WhatsApp groups can resemble a town square filled with haters, racists, liars, and abusers. Enabling privacy is virtuous and essential. Enabling the rapid and large-scale spread of dangerous, distorted, and deceitful content is irresponsible and dangerous. This article uh, was published in December of 2019. And, you know, my thought on it is, look at this, these, these ads for hiring. This is WhatsApp Trust and Safety Contractor. $25 an hour. Look at this one. Anti-abuse specialist. WhatsApp business trust and safety job. All the people, all the money that is being spent on trust and safety at the tech monopolies. This is a competitive advantage. And you have, you know, Techonomy here saying that WhatsApp is a threat to society. Um, this is what, uh, you know, 14 months ago. And now WhatsApp is is doing that, right? They're, they've they've come out and said, "Hey, we're trying to get better at this. We're working on this." You know, this guy goes on to say, "This is not theoretical." Oh my! WhatsApp messages have incited a series of lynchings in India, swayed an election in Brazil, sparked riots in Indonesia. The platform has become a breeding ground breeding ground for white supremacy, and the provenance of such messages is not only unverifiable but in many cases has been shown to be coming from organized purveyors with dark campaign agendas. If Facebook and WhatsApp is on top of this, what's Apple doing? And if I was Facebook, why isn't iMessages, why isn't Apple, um, Apple Podcasts, um, Apple iMessages, where is Apple's trust and safety department? Why isn't Apple pruning and, and engaging in trust and safety on iMessages, right? iMessages is breeding the same amount of vitriol and um, abuse and extremism. And that needs to be reined in, gang. Uh, and, and, and if I was Facebook, you know, and I'm investing all this money in this, hey, Apple, what are you doing? iMessages, right? Why are they not uh, out in front of this? and embracing this as they should because they're a tech monopoly and they don't want to um, promote violence or, or be a part of inciting violence or extremism for that matter. So it only makes sense uh, that Apple and iMessages start to do the same thing, right? To weed out extremism, to monitor what you're saying to people, uh, to you know, kick people off of iMessages or suspend people or you know, uh, um, whatever the different protocols are. To, to, you know, um, WhatsApp has been limiting articles that you can share in WhatsApp, right? To try and clamp down on just rampant extremism on that platform. So what's Apple doing in all of this? Apple, you're behind the ball here. You got to get on this extremism. It's a big problem for you, Apple. And that is the story of the tech monopolies. These tech monopolies are only at the beginning of this content censorship, censorship journey. Uh, you can't turn back the clock. You can't close Pandora's box. Content censorship is now a must-have for the tech monopolies, and now that expectation is being passed down onto the uh, com the the other platform competitors that that don't have the money to pay for all this stuff, like a Telegram. Um, I'm sure Clubhouse is going to get it eventually too. All the other alternative uh, social media content platforms are all getting hit for where's your where's your content censorship? Where's your moderation? Where's your trust and safety team that you got to pay millions and millions of dollars to every year? Uh, and if you don't have those things, you are an extremist, uh, inviting, breeding frenzy, and and you're doing something very wrong to society. Right? That's the narrative. Uh, and if you don't get on that, well, you know. You're just, you're just uh, a horrible platform, aren't you? Can't make some of this stuff up. It just, it's just, you know, it just, it's just, it's, it's just hilarious. Um, so found this article, Agora, the technology provider behind hit audio app Clubhouse says it does not store user data. 
well, why would that matter? You know, why why would anything, you know, be suspect about Agora? Oh. Just so happens that this article is actually on the SCMP. That's the South China Morning Post. That's the mouthpiece of the CCP. The reason why the SCMP is talking about Agora is because Agora is a Chinese tech company. And Agora is apparently the technology infrastructure behind Clubhouse. Clubhouse is the audio only kind of like podcasting radio rooms that you can join and live stream. There's no video. It's just audio only. With operations in China and the U.S., Agora has come under the spotlight as the provider of critical back-end real-time communication services to Clubhouse. Oh my God, I can't make this up. In the past five years, Agora has seen a hundredfold growth in usage among its audio service partners. With dual headquarters in Shanghai and Santa Clara, California, Agora is the thing powering Clubhouse, the hottest new social app in Silicon Valley. Oh. Uh, uh. In an exclusive interview with South China Morning Post, co-founder and Agora's head of Asia Pacific and Emerging Markets, Tony Wong, said the company does not store user data. After some users question the firm's data protection practices, given that one of its headquarters is in China. This is a Chinese company, gang. Okay. Uh, uh, don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't let the Santa Clara office fool you. Just like Zoom is basically a Chinese company too. Wang says, Agora is just a Passover. We don't store any end user data and our clients will typically encrypt their user data. But then he goes on to say that Agora only stores data related to network quality to improve its algorithm, as well as data needed for billing clients since the business operates on a pay-per-use basis. But on the information level, as regards to users, we have no awareness of that. Neither Clubhouse nor Agora has confirmed their relationship, and Wong has declined to comment on Clubhouse. Okay, mm-hmm, yeah. Bet Clubhouse doesn't want this out there, do they? Agora's data protection practices came under scrutiny recently when netizens uh, noticed that the company's S1 filing to the SEC last June acknowledged that Chinese laws may compel it to provide assistance in government investigations on national security grounds or in criminal cases. Oh, yeah, that's right. When the CCP says, hey, Tony, uh, yeah, I need all that data um, from the Clubhouse app. Um, and yeah, if you don't do it, um, I'm going to, I'm going to shut down your whole business and I'll probably jail you and your whole family. Um, so yeah, Tony, I'm going to need that data in like the next two minutes. Founded in 2014 by Wong and, uh, another Tony, um, former chief technology officer at, uh, another Chinese live streaming giant, um, Agora develops software that improves the existing internet infrastructure to ensure stable transfers of real time voice and video data thus helping platforms like Clubhouse achieve real-time engagement for all users. Agora said that 80% of its revenue comes from China. So it'd be a real shame then if the CCP wants something from Agora, and then Agora says, well, no, I don't want to, I don't want to give you the Clubhouse data. And then they say, well, you know, your whole business, is, you know, 80% of your revenue is from China. So if you don't give me that, well, yeah, you can kiss your whole business goodbye. What do you think is going to happen? So anyway, um, curious Clubhouse. Are you working with Agora? And if you are, um, do you know where your data is going? Is it going through a server in China or Hong Kong? Kind of the same thing these days. Um, what assurances do you have? And, um, you know, wh why wouldn't you feel the need to, uh, to kind of get out in front of this, right? It's not, it's not, um, it's not too confidence inspiring when, you hear this from the South China Morning Post and neither company wants to acknowledge or deny are they actually working together kind of just draws a lot of questions. Curious if Clubhouse has any thoughts on, yeah, how their products actually built and what dependencies they have on how the CCP feels when it wakes up in the morning. So that is it for us on Winner Take All. Thank you very much for joining us and I will talk to you soon.